So when a publisher first talked to me about writing a book, uh, this book, To the Last Breath, uh, they asked me a question. They asked me, what's the arc? I thought, well, of course I know what the arc is. And we all know what the arc is, right? Everybody knows what the arc is. This is the arc. <laughs> so no, 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 not, not that arc. The arc of your life, the story of your life. Ah, OK. So this is the arc of my life. <laughs> now, you might think that the natural place to start a story is at the beginning, which would be right here. Um, but that would be a mistake in my case, because at this point in my life, I was really boring. So I'm going to jump ahead to right about here when I was 37 years old. And at that point in my life, um, I was here. I was climbing El Cap. It's 3,000 feet of sheer vertical granite in Yosemite Valley, California. And, and more particularly, when my story starts, I'm actually about two-thirds of the way up. I'm about there. I'm 2,000 feet straight off the deck, and I'm in a cot. Um, only, it's not 7 in the morning, like when this photo was taken. It's actually closer to midnight. So what it really looked like was this. <laughs> and I'm out of balance. Um, I'm hanging dangerously off center, but I am completely oblivious until some dim awareness for the world shakes me awake. And I lift up my head, I look down at my feet, and sure enough, I'm not flat. The cot isn't flat. The cot is crooked, just dangerously crooked. And as my eyes adjust to the dark, um, I look up at the strips of webbing that are holding the cot together, and I can see that one of the strips is unraveling. And I realize that in a few moments, that strip will come completely undone, and the cot is going to drop out from under us. And there is nothing we can do to stop that from happening. So I look over the edge of the cot, down into the void, and I wait for the inevitable. And I fall. I fall. And at some point in all our lives, we will all fall. We will all fall. The question is, what kind of person are you going to become when you get back up? So I'm going to tell you what kind of person I became when I get back up. But I first have to tell you the kind of person I was. So in my teens, I started rock climbing. I got into a surfboard for the first time in my 20s. And then I realized in my 30s that if I combined those two sports, surfing and climbing, I could actually be the first at something. I could be the first person to summit the highest mountain on every continent and surf every ocean. I called it the first global surf and turf. <laughs> and at that point in my life, nothing else mattered but doing this. I mean, I used to look at a map of the world, and I would just see places to conquer. I would see mountains to climb and oceans to surf. But taking that journey changed me. The way I look at the world changed. The way I teach changed. The role I see that science has in the world changed. So that was the way I used to look at the world. Let me show you how I look at the world now. As a physicist who works on global sustainability. So what I'm going to do is I am going to take that entire map and I'm going to put it onto a graph. And on one axis is energy use per capita. And on the other axis is GDP per capita. Now let's take that entire planet and let's put it on this graph, OK? So down here, Africa, then Asia. South America, Europe, North America. So that's pretty suggestive data. I mean, what does that suggest? Well, what it suggests is that the more energy you burn, the richer you are. The more energy you burn, the richer you are. The more energy you burn, the richer you are. The more energy you burn, the richer you are. 
Okay, now hold that thought. And now, for the next couple minutes, let's just focus on the billion people that live down here. They are malnourished. They are impoverished. They live on less than $2 a day. They suffer from polio and malaria and cholera, all things that have been eradicated up here, but they suffer by the millions from it down here. And as a result, down here, life is short. Up here, life expectancy, high 70s, low 80s. Down here, life expectancy, low 50s. If you were born in Sierra Leone, life expectancy, 47 years old. If I had been in Sierra Leone, odds are by now I'd be dead. In fact, someone woke up this morning in this region of the world and walked seven miles just to get clean water. Dust ticking up from their bare feet, walking that hard, desperately hard path in life. So let's think for a moment about what we can do to make that hard path just a little bit easier. Okay? Let's, let's set a modest goal. Let's set a modest goal. Let's commit to deploying the electricity and the pumping stations and the roads and the clinics that can lift this region of the world up out of poverty. Now, I say a modest goal. We're not going to be so ambitious as to match it to the developed world, not even, not even halfway up. Instead, let's have a goal of just lifting this region of the world up one-third. OK. So here's a question a physicist like me asks. This is an energy graph, right? How much energy would it take? How much energy would it take to actually achieve that goal and lift this region of the world up out of poverty, to, to build those roads, to build those clinics, to deploy the electricity, to build that water pumping station, how much energy would it take? And the answer is, if it's done in the exact same way as the developed world, the answer is 160 quadrillion BTUs. What does that mean? Well, what that means, again, if it's done in the same way as the developed world, it means another five billion barrels of fuel burned every year, 150 coal plants, 100 natural gas plants, 150 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I mean, there is a huge negative environmental footprint to what I just described. Right? So what do we do? Right? If, if lifting this region of the world up out of poverty has irreversible negative environmental impact, what do we do? Well, here's one thing we could do. We could turn to this part of the world and we could say, oh, sorry. You know, but if we help you out, if we actually lift you up out of poverty, it risks irreversible environmental damage. So really, sorry, but you're going to have to take it for the team and just suffer down here. Well, that's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. But there's an alternative. Change the paradigm. Change the paradigm. Change the way we're thinking about this. Stop thinking that the only path to prosperity is by burning more energy. Instead, we have to bend the curve. We have to find ways for economies to grow without increasing energy intensity. And oh, by the way, not just here, but here and here. We all have to find a way to be more energy efficient. We have to. In fact, up here, right now, today, in the United States, we are wasting half the energy that we're burning. We're wasting it. So let me ask you a question. How many people here want to be more energy efficient? Great. Now, how many are actually doing something about it? Right. It's about 5%. And that's the average in this country. About 5% of the public does anything about energy efficiency. It's a stuck problem. It's been that way for decades. It's a stuck problem. Why? You know, why is it so hard? 
because it's a pain in the ass, right? I mean, think about it. Would you, would you want to spend your Sunday afternoon plugging the leaks in your window or watching a football game? Now, I'm a Washington Redskins fan, so I actually should be spending my time plugging the windows, right? <laughs> but, it's, uh, but it's a stuck problem. So how do you solve a stuck problem? Well, historically, there's actually been a technique to solve stuck problems. And it's been working for 300 years. For 300 years, the technique I'm going to mention has actually been working to not only solve stuck problems, but create radical change. You ready? Here it is. You have a competition, you offer a prize. <laughs> that's it. You have a competition, you offer a prize. Now, when I say that's been working for 300 years, here's what I mean. Commercial navigation came from a prize. Commercial aviation, a prize. Commercial space aviation, a prize. Canned food, a prize. Plastics industry, a prize. Hundreds of breakthroughs have come from offering prizes. So why don't we try it here? Why don't we offer a prize to the most energy efficient community in the country and make it available to the communities that need it the most? And that is exactly what we're doing. The Georgetown University Energy Prize. It's open to the communities that need it the most. Any community in the United States with a population between 5,000 and 250,000 can compete to see which is the most energy efficient. We will have a quarterfinals, a semifinals, a finals, and then announce the winner. It will be the Super Bowl of energy efficiency. <laughs> and the winner gets $5 million. And it starts next February right here at Georgetown University. So, I came a long way in my journey. You know, I used to look at the world like this, and now I look at the world like this. I used to look at places to conquer, and now I recognize this. A scientist, a student, any of us, any of us, when inspired by a sense of social purpose, can build a better world. I've had the good fortune to stand at the highest point in every continent to serve the waves of every ocean, and this is what I have learned. The universe is clothed in formulas, but it speaks in stories, and we have to be mindful of the words. There is warmth and humor, tragedy and heroism, frailty and challenge in the stories of the world. But there is always a way to participate, to restore a torn page, to shape the story, and if necessary, with enough will by pushing, pushing to the last breath, you can steer that story towards something better. That was my journey. This is our journey. Help steer it. Thank you. <laughs>